What's up guys? Welcome to the channel. I'm Chris Lado, a retired F-16 pilot turned UAP investigating YouTuber. Uh, my mind was blown away when the Navy videos were declassified uh, and the gimbal video especially was just mind blowing to me. I've been in a online debate, if you will, with noted debunker Mick West. I thought the discussion was ended after I believe I proved definitively that because we're in a turning engagement with the gimbal object, because it's a turning engagement, I showed through trigonometry using two different techniques, so the hand-drawn fighter pilot technique and the DCS simulator, that this couldn't be some faraway object. It was within 10 nautical miles. I thought this ended the debate because inside of 10 nautical miles, we should be able to dis discern using these advanced targeting pod systems what this object is. That was not the case because Mick West continues. He's still on TV. He's still interviewing people and doing the same thing he did with me, making a, making us look at these for these pixels, right? That I that I honestly can't see. And I believe I can show definitively that it, it actually is a unexplained aerial phenomena. And you can see all of the math. I'm really excited about this video. I wanna give a special thanks to my patrons. Really appreciate all your help, financial and otherwise. Thanks for your guidance. If you wanna be a patron as well, join the team. Uh, link is in the description. As always, just being here is the best form of support, just watching. So thank you for being here. And please like and subscribe if you do like the content. Now, onto the video. So there's a derotation mechanism built in to correct that. It simply rotates the entire image back so the horizon is in the right place. If you derotate an image in which the background has rotated but the glare has not rotated, then it's going to look like the glare rotates but the background doesn't. We can demonstrate that by using the same video from earlier. The simplest way to derotate it is just to film it with another camera. Now the image remains stable, but the glare seems to rotate. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to assume that Mick West is correct. I'm going to ignore all of the other points that would be inconvenient, I guess, for his hypothesis, okay? So those things, let's just ignore first off that Mick has yet to, to show an actual spinning flare example, or he calls it glare. I believe what we're actually talking about is lens flare. We'll just ignore the fact that he has yet to show an actual spinning example of a flare pod. Okay, he hasn't shown one. I haven't, I've yet to see a spinning example. Even in the FLIR video, he says it spins, but you know, it sure doesn't look like it spins. Okay, we're gonna ignore that. Let's just ignore the fact that the object is not shaped like lens flare that we should expect from this at FLIR pod, right? Because the, as Mick says in his own words, the lens flare or glare, he calls it, is the shape of the aperture. But these systems actually don't have an aperture. They don't work that way. The FLIR system, according to Dave Falch, uses actually a detection timer. So it just limits the detection on the sensor to microseconds. So what we should assume is the aperture or the lens flare, if you will, should be the shape of the lens, which will be circular. So we should be seeing circular lens flare instead of this <laughs> alien saucer shaped lens flare, okay? So let's ignore that, okay? Let's also ignore the fact that it doesn't pulsate. Using FLIR systems, if you look at an actual jet engine, you're gonna see pulsating, okay? Because the actual heat is, is pushing out into the, into the air. Also the turbines inside, the metal hot turbine is spinning very fast. So you're gonna see a lot of pulsating like this. So if this was in fact a lens flare, as Mick West proposes, we should be expecting some pulsation. There should be some shaking from the heat in the, into the atmosphere, okay? But, but we don't see any of this. It doesn't look like a normal engine. But again, let's just ignore that. Also, let's ignore that it's in uh, maximum narrow field of view. Okay, so as you actually zoom in, the internal optics of a lens will actually weed out a lot of these artifacts. But photographic lenses of today don't look as simple as this. They look more like this. This complexity allows, for example, adjusting the focus and also produces sharper images with less unwanted artifacts. Especially zoom lenses are very complex and consist of many different movable lens groups or lens elements. Okay, so you actually get less lens flare as you zoom in. You can see in this example that I made uh, in my garage. So as you zoom in, we actually see less uh, lens flare. Okay, so never mind that this pod is fully zoomed in. Never mind we don't see any other optical artifacts. Okay, we should also be seeing, if this is a real lens flare, we should be seeing halos, we should be seeing ghosts, you should be seeing shrieks, some other artifact. Okay, but yet there's, there's none of that except for these pixels 
that it, honestly I can't see the pixels. Okay, if somebody could show or prove it with math or something that these pixels are actually moving, but I looked on a giant screen with the HD version and sat there and stared at it for like 10 minutes and couldn't see anything. So I, I don't know, if somebody could show me that, maybe. Okay, but again, let's just ignore that. Let's ignore the fact the actual gimbal object actually grows by 7% is what my calculations. If you measure it at the 12 second mark, and then you measure it again at the 33 second mark, so both in, in black hot, what you'll notice is actually increases the size by 7% in a linear fashion. Can lens flare do that? Can it grow slightly in a linear fashion? Because according to my calculations, I believe the F-18s close by about 5%, from 5.9 nautical miles to 6.2 is on the near end, okay? So I do believe they close on the object, which is why we see a slight increase in size. Let's ignore that, okay? Let's ignore the fact that the object rotates less than what is mechanically required by the pod. So mechanical engineer Paul Bradley did an exhaustive analysis of the internal mechanics of the pod and found that the actual gimbal of the pod requires 150 plus or minus 20 degree turn. So minimum of 130 degrees turn. If you, if you say everything is ultra conservative, okay, with all the variances, double what they could be. But the actual gimbal object only turns 110 degrees. And it's, and it's in a stair-step fashion. And it's slower than what I remember from a gimbal, okay? So we will avoid that, don't worry about it. Okay, never mind that all the experts say that <laughs> this, this lens flare, or glare as he calls it, is not possible, in, you know, including Dave Falch, including the man, John Earhart, who literally rebuilds these things. <laughs> as his job. He literally rebuilds at Flare Pods. He did an interview with Jeremy Corbell, and I'll let you hear what he says right here. Would you consider yourself an expert in the AT Flare systems? Yes. You worked for Boeing seven yeah. years and three months. Our job was to build test equipment for the front end of the AT Flare. It's got the gimbal and the IR channel, visible channel, relay optics and some steering mirrors and the coup de path back to where the laser is. We had to be able to build the equipment that the Navy sailors could use to test out all those components and make sure they were good, get them back together, get them back on the plane and get the plane flying again. That object is turning. Yeah, nothing inside the AT Flare system is or could cause the rotational flux of the target that is at a higher rate than the background. There's no way the optics are, are causing that rotation. He says what Mick West is proposing, the spinning lens flare, is not possible. That's what he says. Okay, so the experts are saying that. Lou Elizondo, he says that he talked to the pilots. They actually saw it with their eyes. They said that it does. It was a real object, it rotates. Uh, all the pilots, myself as well, as a, at least I can consider myself an expert using these pods. I used them for 17 years. The sniper pod, okay, I believe it's equivalent. Never mind, I haven't seen that, okay? So we'll just, we'll ignore that. So all the experts, we'll just ignore. And we'll just ignore all the context, okay? So never mind that uh, the pilot and the WIZO were talking about this thing. Uh, never mind the other additional points about the ASA. There's Many of them, it's flying against the wind, et cetera. So we'll just assume all the calm doesn't apply. Okay, so we will ignore everything. Okay, all that stuff I just mentioned, which I think on its own is pretty strong, okay? But let's just not worry about it. Once we assume all that stuff doesn't apply, let's just say Mick West, for the sake of argument, is correct. Okay, the lens system in front of the derotation device, okay, as it spins to uh, assess the gimbal, okay? Because what happens this pod, it's like a ballerina. Right? It's tracking you, tracking you, tracking you, but at some point it only has two degrees of motion, so it has to like turn around really fast. Okay, that, that, that's basically a summary of what of what the gimbal uh, has to do. Okay, at some point it, it does have to spin, and that lens element will spin. Okay, so let's assume that this is a lens flare somehow, and it's spinning, and Mick West is correct. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us at? Why don't we just Continue on with my previous argument, what I was doing. I determined that the range is inside of 10 nautical miles. I believe it's 7.4 nautical miles, plus or minus half a mile. And what I had to stop at, I couldn't get the size of the object when I initially looked at the gimbal UAP. I couldn't get the size because I didn't know the field of view of the target pod. I thought it was classified, to be honest. Uh, I didn't know the field of view, and I, I asked, you know, a subscriber, hey, anybody know the field of view? Does anyone have a manual for one of these pods or a user manual? I received nothing, okay? I found from Mick West, of all people, right? So he found one, through one of his videos that the field of view of the pod is actually 0.7 degree. That's a narrow field of view, okay? So zoomed in twice, the actual 
field of view of the pod as we see it in the gimbal UAP is 0.35 degrees across. So now what we can use that for something. Okay, so I may not be an expert in optics as everybody on all you optical nerds like to, to point out to me, okay? But I do know something that you probably don't know as an optical nerd, and that is mill radian sizing. Mill radian sizing. That's what every combat aviator knows, as well as snipers. So here's mill radians and how we can use it to size the gimbal object. Just like men of the Vangle, we can take this word and break it down to see what it means for us. A radian is already an angle of measurement. A radian is if you take the radius of a circle, which is the measurement from the center to the outside edge, and if you were to take that measurement and wrap that around the outside edge of the circle, so we'll estimate it's maybe about that long, connect the center back out to that, this angle right there, that's one radian. Well, milli is metric for a thousand. Think one meter has a thousand millimeters inside of it. So if we divide this up into a thousand little tiny pieces, just one of those pieces is one mil radian. So that small segment right there, that angle is one mil radian. So what it tells us is that at a thousand units, it's going to be something that's one of those units tall. So at a thousand yards, one mil radian is one yard tall. But also at a thousand meters, it's one meter tall. Heck, even at a thousand inches, one mil radian is one inch tall. It's always a relationship of a thousandth, and that's how it works. Easier way to talk about angles of a circle, because it's related to the radius of the circle. As the radius uh, increases, so does the size of the circumference. And so it's, it's all uh, in relation. And so if we use that, one radian is equal to 57.2958 degrees, okay? because 2 pi r equals 360 degrees. I measured at 12 seconds in the UAP, and I measured, okay, and then I was able to convert that math, because I know the whole field of view, I converted into radians, it is equal to 6.11 milliradians all the way across that, that field of view, and then if you measure the UAP object at 12 seconds, what I came up with is it measured at 0.379 milliradians okay so now we know the milliradian size so at 60,000 feet away that's 10 nautical miles that's what uh, Mick West believes it's no further than that if it is further as I showed it has to be traveling well over supersonic so at 60,000 feet 10 nautical miles one milliradian is equal to 60 feet that's why mills are so easy to use okay so one milliradian is equal to 60 feet at 60,000 feet but this is 0.379 milliradian. So we just multiply 0.379 times 60 feet and we get to a size of 22.74 feet for this thing. That's how long it is, right? 22 feet. Meanwhile, the average length of a Hornet is 58 feet. So this lens flare that Mick argues is going to somehow cover up the whole rest of the object is only 22.74 feet across. So the question is, where is the rest of the object. We should be able to see it. I mentioned that it actually grows, so the size of the object actually grows. So at time 33 seconds, uh, it's at 0.422 milliradians. This gives an average size of the UAP of 25.32 feet. So even at the, at the largest that the gimbal object appears, is still only 25 feet across. That is less than half the length of an F-18 fighter. And an F-18 is not that big, you know, it's still, it's a reasonably sized fighter. So. <laughs> How do you guys answer that one? Say you're right, Mick. Say you're correct. It's a lens flare. Where is the plane? Even better, if you use my analysis that I, that I found, again, using two different techniques, Mick West has yet to rebuttal the actual range of this object, okay? Because I believe he can't rebuttal it. The only thing they came back with was true airspeed <laughs> from, from an F-18 chart from 1962. Okay, which is just completely wrong. So I haven't heard any other rebuttals talking about the actual DCS simulator or how I actually drew it. Okay, so as far as that goes, based on my own assessment, which is 7.4 nautical miles away, plus or minus five, the gimbal object is 18.4 feet long. So that's my estimate. I think this thing is 18 and a half feet long. I think it's 7.4 nautical miles away. And I think it's an unexplained aerial phenomenon. I think it looks exactly like what it is. 
all, for all those reasons, even if we ignore all of the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning, which I think are compelling, really compelling. You know, if you look, there's no saucer shaped FLIR. Even in, in his own example, Mick's own example of using <laughs> the Chilean example from over 60 miles away, which is ridiculous, right? 60 miles away. Even in that, it was in circles. So how is it going to create this, this miraculous uh, saucer shaped lens flare? Okay. Anyway, even if we have ignore all of those things, which I believe on their own solve this, even if you're right, Mick, please explain to me how a 25 foot lens flare can cover up a 56 foot airplane. And even then, how are we looking down the engine? It's like a flying engine. We know this is going sideways. So I don't know how else to show you guys. It's, it's <laughs> that this is a real UAP. I think information is going to come out. I think you'll see, I think we'll learn very soon that this is a, a real UAP. And I think the likes of, of Joe Scott, I think you guys should start looking at the evidence, actually look at the evidence instead of being just afraid to accept it. There is a ton of evidence, and I think this, this will hold on its own. Thanks for watching, guys. If this isn't enough, then I'll just go into more detail on, on all of these other reasons that I just covered uh, very shortly. But I, I think that's pretty compelling. Thank you so much to my patrons. Really appreciate it, guys. It made this video so much better. If you want to be a Patreon, please join the team. But really just being here and watching and being open-minded. I, I question people like Joe Scott, who are just gonna say that they're not gonna believe it. If evidence presents itself, you need to go and look at the evidence. If it's compelling evidence that can change your views on the world, then change your views on the world. We, we have always been wrong in the past. Humans have never been correct. We just get a little bit more correct as we go along. We don't know nearly as much as we think we know about the universe. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you like the content. Have a great week, peace.